Welcome to Sound Bites, hosted by registered dietitian nutritionist Melissa Joy Dobbins. Welcome back to the Sound Bites podcast. I wanted to thank everybody who has reached out to me recently about the show. It's been really great to hear your feedback and excitement about the guests and the topics. It really means so much to me. It's it's literally the wind beneath my podcast wings. It really is. So keep those good vibes coming. Now today's episode is about nutrigenomics, which is a science studying the relationships between the human genome, nutrition, and health. This episode is not sponsored. I attended a conference in January in Toronto where Nutrisystem sponsored one of the sessions, and I was given the opportunity to take their DNA body blueprint test for free. I was so impressed with the information they presented and with the test itself that I invited their dietitian, Courtney McCormick, to be on the show. Stay tuned to the end of the show for exciting announcements about this really cool giveaway that we discussed during the episode, and also some diabetes-related information on behalf of my partnership with the American Association of Diabetes Educators. I hope you enjoy the show. Hello, and welcome back to the Sound Bites podcast. I'm your host, Melissa Joy Dobbins, a registered dietitian nutritionist. And on the show, I like to delve into the science, the psychology, and the strategies behind good food and nutrition. And today we are talking about nutrigenomics. We're going to get into weight management and DNA. And recently I took the Nutrisystem DNA body blueprint test, sort of like the 23andMe for weight management, if you will. And I'm going to share some of those results with you today. It was very interesting and I can't wait to dive into that. But we also have a very exciting giveaway, which we will share details about later. My guest today is Courtney McCormick. She is a registered dietitian nutritionist with a master's in public health. Currently, she serves as the manager of clinical research and nutrition at Nutrisystem. And in this role, she helps support the nutritional strategy and clinical research for both the Nutrisystem and South Beach Diet brands. Welcome to the show, Courtney. Hey, thank you so much for having me on the show. I am so excited to have you on and to give us all of this interesting information about what Nutrisystem is up to these days, including this DNA body blueprint test, which is really exciting. But I had the opportunity to meet you recently at a conference. Um, Nutrisystem sponsored a session, and that's where I had this awesome opportunity to take this test. And then I spoke with you, and I was really intrigued with your background So you have quite a background and career in public health. So I'd love for you to share that with our listeners before we kind of get into Nutrisystem and this DNA test. Absolutely. As you mentioned, yeah, I have a lot of variety in my background. I first started out my career in actually in the nonprofit sector, working a lot around public health nutrition programs, mostly focused on nutrition, weight management, and really around obesity prevention. And in these programs, typically the work I did was really around capacity building at the organizational level, as well as working really around systems and policy change. So really trying to make our environment, you know, the places that we live, work, play, making it healthier um, for everybody. Wonderful. And I mean, you even did some travel. I can't remember the specifics. It wasn't mission trips, but tell me a little bit about that. Yes. Yeah, so actually, um, I kind of took a year off in between uh, my undergrad and going to get my master's. And I did a year of service with the AmeriCorps program. It's kind of like the domestic version of Peace Corps. Hmm. And so in that program, I was actually based out in Dayton, Ohio. And I was working in after school programs and school based programs, helping children learn about nutrition, get physically active. And so I spent a year doing that work out in Ohio. Exciting. So, how does somebody with such a strong public health background become interested in working at Nutrisystem? Well, so I like to challenge myself. And, you know, after working in that nonprofit sector for 
you know, close to 10 years, I, I really was ready for a change. And it, it kind of just all happened. I, I saw this job posting for Nutrisystem and I, it kind of intrigued me, the idea of getting to work kind of on product development and doing some research. You know, the more I started to actually look into the company, I was really impressed with that Nutrisystem, our programs and products really are based on science and research. And as a dietitian, I held that as being really valuable. Um, and so that's what really wanted me to kind of learn more about the company. And, you know, when I got here and saw the great work that we're doing around making sure that our nutritional programs really are safe and effective and that we're using those evidence-based practices for weight management, you know, I knew this was the place for me. Wonderful. And we are going to talk a little bit more a little later in the podcast about the research and the tools and programs and things that are available and a lot about behavior change and also who's doing the counseling. So stay tuned for that. But I wanted to jump into my DNA test results. And Courtney, you were kind enough to review my report so that we could have a robust discussion about this. And to everybody listening, of course, I can't share everything with you in the interest of time. But we both pulled out some things that kind of caught our eye that were, you know, kind of maybe surprising or confirming of, you know, my suspicions. And Courtney is going to sort of explain the science behind it. So before I get into that, speaking of the science, can you share, and I remember in the session, it was a little complex because it's nutrigenomics. It's, you know, it's kind of new to all of us. But can you just explain, if people are familiar with like 23andMe and those types of tests, how does the science work? How do we get the DNA from a person and kind of connect the dots with regard to our um, weight management propensity, I guess, uh, you know, our different tendencies, if you will. You know, for our DNA body blueprint, um, it is, you know, a secure at home DNA test, um, very similar to 23andMe ancestry type tests that people are taking today. Um, and really what our test involves is just a simple swab of your cheek. Um, so from there, we can collect a sample of your DNA. That actually sample then gets sent to our lab partner, which we partner with Akesogen, which is really an industry leader in the space around genetic testing. So they're using, you know, all of the state-of-the-art equipment to really genotype and look at what do your genes say, what are your genes that you have. And then we've also partnered with Genetic Direction, and they really are a leading provider of DNA-based health management programs. And with this partnership, We've been able to really, you know, leverage their expertise. Genetic Direction has a whole team that is continually going through the latest data on genomics, and they've actually created a proprietary algorithm for us. So when someone takes our DNA test, we read what their genetic makeup is, and that gets put into a report that will spit out some outcomes um, around metabolism, around specific eating behaviors around how you break down carbs, protein, fat, and all of that data that we're giving you and recommendations are based on this science, which is looking at these large genome studies, looking at associations between one's DNA and specific outcomes. Right. Thank you. Ironically, I took the 23andMe test the same day I did this one. I had already decided to do it for myself and my mom as a Christmas present, and then I found out that we were going to get to do this DNA body blueprint. So I just happened to do them on the same day. And what I learned from the 23andMe results and what we've discussed at the conference in prepping for this podcast interview is this information, this data, it really is mostly worded in the sense of you are more likely this, less likely that. For example, on 23andMe, I'm less likely to, to like cilantro, but I love cilantro. Um, I'm also less likely to have a widow's peak, but I have a widow's peak. So, you know, it, Courtney, you can speak more to that, but I just wanted to kind of set the stage that these aren't like you're this, you're that. It's information to kind of help guide us. And, and we'll talk about that more too as we kind of go through some specifics. Yeah, and you're absolutely right. What I always tell people when it comes to DNA testing and looking at your genes, the outcomes that are being reported, it really is kind of telling you your probability. It's not really telling you your predictability. So, you know, it's not really saying that this is your end all and be all destiny. It's really that you're maybe more predisposed to certain outcomes 
And so maybe you need to be more mindful of the environment you put yourself in and the behaviors that you adopt as opposed to someone else with a different genetic makeup. But to your point, it doesn't mean that just because you have a trait that says, you know, you're you're more likely to not like cilantro, you know, as you said, you love cilantro. Mm -hmm. So it's not your final destiny. Let's keep that in mind, everybody yeah. listening as, as we move forward with this. So I would like to give a brief weight history of myself. We are not going to get into, I would say, dieting history and all of that. Uh, that's maybe a subject for another podcast, not mine. But I do want to kind of give a brief overview with some things that I think will tie in together with some of my results. So as most of my listeners know, I'm 50 years old, and uh, I've been, I would say, kind of a normal weight most of my life, although I was a very skinny kid. That might have been due to being on food stamps or just genetically. Both my brother and I were really skinny. And I'm not really sure about my family history for obesity. I do know that my maternal grandmother was a regular attendee at Tops, you know, take off pounds sensibly and Weight Watchers. I still have her Tops bracelet, but I never saw her overweight. So I'm not really sure there. We're going to talk a little bit more about that when we go through the specific results. In addition, my regular listeners know this also, I grew up studying ballet. And uh, when I went off to a performing arts high school, I was 5'8", still 5'8", and I was about 115 pounds. And that was just, I was just naturally a skinny kid. I was 14 years old and hadn't really hit puberty hard and fast yet. And um, it was just a normal weight for me. But I went through adolescence and kind of filled out, if you will. But I think my experience attending a performing arts high school and being in the ballet world, I knew I wasn't overweight, but compared to that aesthetic, you know, ideal, certainly always was watching my weight and trying to lose weight. I would say in college and graduate school is where sort of my eating normalized. And that's where um, in graduate school, I started doing weightlifting. And I saw a huge benefit in that to my weight. So that was like my secret weight loss or weight management tool, if you will. As an adult, like I said, kind of pretty much normal weight. I was almost 40 when I got pregnant and I was trying to only gain 25 pounds, you know, the dietitian in me. I was right on track. And then at the end, I gained 40, but pretty much went back to my normal weight afterwards. Then in my mid 40s, I started running as a midlife experiment, which I've talked about on the podcast before. When I started doing longer runs and a triathlon, that's when I think there was this trifecta working against me and I, and I put on about 10 pounds. Um, and I think what happened was I was getting older. And I was not doing the strength training because I was doing all of the running and the biking and the swimming and, and the longer runs. And those longer runs made me hungry. And I typically am very lucky. I, I'm not, I don't get hungry very often. So it's a lot easier for me to control my portions and, and try to eat more moderately. Doesn't mean I don't crave certain foods and I can't pack in a lot of calories if I'm not careful, but I don't have that hunger issue. But those long runs made me hungry, and I don't think I refueled properly. So I attributed that 10-pound weight gain to that. But then in the last few years, perimenopausal, I've, my weight's creeped up five to eight pounds more. So I've been using my fitness pal, tracking my food uh, for a few months and aiming for about 1,300 calories a day, about 85 grams of fiber, 25, or sorry, not 85 grams of fiber, 85 grams of protein, and about 25 grams of fiber. And, and it's been going pretty well. So that's pretty much sort of my overall weight um, history. And we'll touch on some of that as we look at the specific details. And I'm, and I'm going to apologize now. I'm going to try not to shuffle a lot of papers, but I do have my report in front of me and I will be flipping through those uh, results. So the first thing, when you take the test, you send it in, you get the results and you get this personalized plan. And really, you know, and Courtney, you can speak to this as we go through also, there's a lot of great information and it's very well organized. And just like the 23andMe, you can kind of take a deeper dive. Well, what does this mean? But we're just going to touch on a few things. And, and also there is a nutrition plan that comes with it. So more like a, a meal plan, if you will. So the first thing that caught my eye was that they said I was a protein powerhouse. So that my results indicated that my body thrives 
on foods high in lean protein and low in fat, along with moderate amounts of carbohydrates. So, and it has each one of those broken out. So we're not saying high protein, we're saying a higher protein, a moderate carbohydrate intake and a lower fat, which basically over the years, I've kind of gravitated towards that anyway, and feel that that works better for me. You know, if you've heard my show before, I did a protein challenge several years ago, aiming for 100 grams of protein. That's a little challenging for me. But just again, that shift, and I talk about being a diabetes educator and and saying how, you know, some people might need a little bit more protein, a little bit less carbs, but other people might do better with, with the shift the other way. So that was sort of confirming for me, Courtney. But if somebody, and, and also Courtney was willing to kind of share some of her results that might compare and contrast with mine. And I should just say that's like, it says uh, 25% or more of protein. Again, it's not saying that I need a high protein, low carb diet. But so if somebody had different results, because uh, Courtney, I think yours were the opposite of mine. What did, what would that mean? Yeah, so you're absolutely right. So mine um, were a little bit different than yours, mostly around the carbohydrates. And so you had mentioned your report really said focus on low fat, moderate carbs, and higher amounts of protein. My report actually was low fat, higher amounts of protein, and also an enhanced level of carbs. But again, when you read through the report, it's not saying I need to be on an extremely high carb diet. When you actually go back and look at the studies that were were looking at that specific gene where we're reporting out on carbs, it really was focused around people who had um, slightly higher levels of carbs, mostly from whole foods like fruits and starchy vegetables and whole grains, the carbs actually did um, contribute some positive benefits to their weight loss outcomes. Um, so for someone like myself, um, where it says I'm enhanced carbs, I, you know, I now try to really focus my diet on not being afraid of carbs, allowing carbs in my diet, but making sure that I'm focusing on really quality carbs and making sure that they are you know, higher in fiber that I'm choosing whole fruits, dairy gets added in. Um, so I really shouldn't be afraid of carbs in my diet because my, my genetic profile is one where enhanced carbs could actually be beneficial when it comes to weight loss for myself. And then I think when we look at your report, it's not necessarily saying that you can't have a higher amount of carbs um, because that's not what the research showed for that specific gene. Um, it really showed that for your actual genetic makeup, carbs come into play, but they may not be as important. So whether you have a higher carb intake or a low carb intake, you're going to see, you know, similar amounts of weight loss. It will really, for you, it's the protein that's going to be important to make sure that you are choosing foods that have a little bit higher protein content in them so that you can get really to that 25% of calories coming from protein. As you said, it's not, it's not an extremely high protein amount but making sure that you're aiming on that higher end of protein intake could be beneficial. Right. And so I think this really underscores, yes, we know that, or maybe we should question it. I mean, calories count, you know, calories a calorie, but in that quote unquote, all diets work as long as you are fewer calories in than out. But this is what is exciting about this newer research is that, yeah, if I'm trying to manage my weight, I might get better results by having the shift towards a little bit more protein, and as you said, moderate carb, and low fat. If I have more fat in my diet, the um, test indicated that it would be a little more difficult for me to manage my weight. Right. So I I think really for someone with your genetic predisposition, it really speaks to the importance of when you're going after those protein foods to try to find foods that will deliver that protein, but also be lower in fat. So looking at low-fat dairy, if you're going to add dairy into your program, thinking about what types of plant-based protein options do you have? Because we know plant-based protein options typically have a little bit less fat than some of the meat-based proteins. It allows you to see not only the macronutrient profile you need, but can kind of puts it all together in kind of a nice bigger picture of what your diet could look like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we're going to touch on fat my impulse control around fats in a little bit, but also in the report, it said for my DNA, when I'm losing weight, um, and we're going to talk about exercise, so I'm jumping a little bit ahead, but when I'm losing weight, I'm more likely to lose some more lean body mass than perhaps somebody else 
So that strength training is really important for weight maintenance, but also especially during weight loss. Correct. And I, and I think, you know, not only the strength training, but then again, I think that's where, you know, having that higher intake of protein could also be beneficial for someone with your um, genetic predisposition. And I have seen that. The next point I want to touch on is the sweet tooth. So it, I think a lot of people would be interested in, you know, how strong is your sweet tooth? I came in normal. And I should say, you know, each point sort of has a different scale. So normal versus above average. I would say that my sweet tooth has really decreased with, I don't know if it's with age, I don't know if it's with hormonal changes, or just kind of normalizing my eating. But my question to you, Courtney, is we know our DNA doesn't change as we age, but my 10-year-old son, I was telling my husband and my son about this uh, interview last night, and oh my gosh, I couldn't even like explain what it was because they had so many questions. <laughs> and my son was like, I want to take the test. I'm like, I don't think it's information for a 10 year old, you know, and I explained to my husband, you know, you don't want any weird dieting things going on with our son. But anyway, our DNA doesn't change. But do certain things get turned off and on? Like, would my if I took this again, or maybe if I took this younger, would it say that I maybe have had an above average sweet tooth? How does the science work with that? Yeah. So in terms of your DNA and your genes, so they they will not change. Um, so, you know, if you took the test again and it was measuring a specific, you know, what we call SNP or single nucleotide polymorphism, if it measures that SNP in your DNA, that will never change. But what we do know is that as we age or um, as, you know, we put ourselves into a new environment, there are ways that we can turn on and off how we express the genes that we have. And this is a whole field called epigenetics, um, which I think, again, we'll see more of in the future as the science continues to progress in this area. So while your DNA itself will not change, the way we express those genes could potentially change. Thank you. I know that that can be confusing, and that was a great explanation. Another one that I wanted to touch on is how likely are you to overeat? And the the options were less likely or more likely. And my results came back less likely. And as I said earlier, I'm not somebody that gets very hungry. I really don't have any portion control problems. Just like everybody else, I, you know, might make poor choices or worse choices and, you know, pack in a lot of calories, but I've never been somebody to, to overeat. So this was interesting to even think, oh, wow, you know, that I was born that way sort of a thing, you know, again, sort of, confirms that. And and what I like about things like this in the report is it gives you sort of, I felt like a lot of my results were very encouraging. Like, yeah, I don't really need to worry about overeating. I mean, not that I was, but it reminds you that you've got all this good stuff on your side. And it gives you sort of warning signs of what to watch out for. Yeah, you know, we really try to add content to our report that that would be positive for our, our customers, but also to make people aware that, you know, in your case, it, where you may not have the gene that says you're going to crave those sweet foods, but we know that our, our genes are just one piece of this larger puzzle. And our environment plays a big role in, you know, as I said, how we express those genes and whether or not we turn genes on and off that we're expressing. And so we wanted to make sure that people were also aware of that in our report because we didn't want to tell someone, you know what, you you don't have a sweet tooth, so you're good to go. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the reality is we live in an environment where sugar's added to everything um, <laughs> or almost everything. Um, and so, you know, still giving people that awareness and, and reminding them of the importance of recognizing added sugars on the food labels recognizing what your daily goals should be and helping people figure out behavioral strategies to make sure that they're reducing some of that added sugar intake in their diet. Because again, just because you have that predisposition to not crave or have a sweet tooth, it doesn't mean that you are not over consuming on added sugars and going above what the dietary guidelines recommends. Right. Yes. And each section has quite a bit of information, but like I said, it's really easily organized so that it's not uh, it's in different sections. So like it'll say Melissa's sweet swaps, pick these, limit these. And really like in the, the limit these category, the only thing that I feel like is an issue for me is candy. I mean, I've been known, I have an M&M issue. I, I just can't buy them. I just can't have them in the house. I mean, you know, I just don't feel bad about it. It's just a fact. 
And then in later in the, the section, it'll say like, do this, skip this. And it's got, you know, really practical tips. And I circled several things that I either do consciously or just to naturally, like, you know, I don't have M&Ms in the house. I, I've said this before on the podcast, my family loves ice cream. And sure, I enjoy ice cream. But, you know, we always have ice cream in the freezer. It's not calling my name. My, my family will tease me because my specific carton will get freezer burn and they'll be, you no, know, they'll run out and they'll start eating mine. I'm like, that's fine. Go ahead, have it. So the report does have, you know, very practical tips as you go through. So here's the one about my impulse control around fatty foods that the results could be normal, slightly below average and below average. And so basically it indicates that I might have a slightly reduced level of impulse control around fatty foods. And I really feel like that's not, you know, sure, I like McDonald's french fries, but I don't, you know, I don't make a special trip to go get them. I don't feel like those types of foods are calling my name. But Courtney, you had some insight on that that I I found really interesting. Yeah, so with this um, trait in particular, so when you actually kind of dive into the research and the studies that were used to support an association between this gene and, and the outcome of impulse control around fatty foods, what they found in the studies was that they actually looked at people as they aged. So this is one of those genes where as you age, you may become more predisposed to expressing that specific gene. Um, so, you know, while you feel that right now you can kind of control yourself and, and you're not really tempted by high fat, high calorically dense foods, as you age, you may see that this changes. And the goal would be that we give you some of those behavior strategies within our report to help you just be mindful of it and recognize how you can kind of cope with those situations when they come up. But again, it, you know, everyone I think will be different in how they express these traits um, and the genes that they have. You know, for yourself, you you may find that this isn't something that's an issue for you, and it could be really your environment. And it may be that you, you know, put yourself in an environment where you're not, you don't have those higher fat, you know, fast foods easily accessible. So it's not something that you typically would even think about craving. Mm-hmm. Well, I do live in a fast food desert. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, I hate to say that, but it's like, oh my gosh, the times when you do want it, you got to drive to Timbuktu. (laughs) But you know, hey, it does help. It does help. I found that really interesting because I think, you know, as a dietitian, 50 years old, you know, you kind of have this, I kind of have this feeling like I just keep getting better at what I'm doing and improving my habits and, you know, really just kind of moving down that spectrum towards a more, you know, ideal diet as as I get older. And we don't always think about there might be a new habit that forms before we even realize. So I'm definitely going to keep that in mind because I may not even realize that that could creep up and, you know, certainly higher fat, you know, calorically dense foods. Well, that's going to be an issue for my weight. And as I mentioned, perimenopause is not the time. Uh, and moving forward, you know, I mean, I said 1300 calories earlier, and maybe our listeners gasped because I tell people a lot that that's what I'm doing. And they're like, oh, my God, I'm like, yeah, just when I was used to 1500, I'm aiming for 1300 now. But on a side note, it's actually been pretty doable. I, I you know, knock on wood, it, it's been working out okay. But I will definitely I think that's one of the benefits of, of these types of reports is that now I'll kind of keep that in check. And it, it won't sneak up on me if in fact, I do have that tendency. So another one I wanted to talk about was caffeine. And Courtney, tell us why caffeine was included in this report. Yeah. So for us, you know, we really felt that it was important to include caffeine. The genes behind this one and what it tells us is, you know, certain people based on your genetic profile, you either can metabolize caffeine very quickly or you metabolize it very slowly. So it really looks at how long caffeine is kept within your body. And the reason we included this, you know, there's really no impact on your weight loss in terms of how long caffeine goes through your system. It really has to do with cardiovascular outcomes um, and cardiovascular disease. But we felt it was important to include because we know that when we talk about weight management, we know there's lots of products, um, supplements on the market today in that weight management space that include caffeine as part of the supplement. And so we, we thought it was really important 
especially as people are, are out there trying different strategies, um, trying to figure out what works best for them. We just wanted people to be aware of, you know, if you're going to incorporate a supplement that has caffeine in it, you may want to know a little bit more about how your body is going to actually process that caffeine. You know, if you are someone who's a slow metabolizer of that caffeine, that really means that that, that caffeine is staying in your system longer um, and can potentially have some negative consequences for your cardiovascular health. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I found that really interesting. There's a similar caffeine test with the 23andMe, um, but I, I honestly, I couldn't understand their explanation of, of what it meant. But in this report, test results could be slow or normal. How well does your body process caffeine? And mine came out slow. For those people who know me, I I do not really do caffeine. I mean, this is me not on caffeine. Like, I don't need caffeine, okay? Me on caffeine could be a little scary. Uh, you know, I drink decaf coffee. Um, the only caffeine I get is from diet soda, and that doesn't really add up to much. And I've always felt like, A, I don't need it, and B, when I do have it, it doesn't really... Other than, like I said, you know, I don't need it. It really hurts my stomach more than anything. It doesn't really make me jittery. I don't really feel much effect from it. And so maybe because I process it slowly, it's not really like spiking and crashing in my body. But I found that really interesting. And, you know, I, want, I wanted to call that out. So let's talk about the body's ability to lose and maintain a healthy weight. So some of this confirmed some of my thoughts and then... I tried not to feel depressed about it because you guys do a great job of saying, this doesn't mean you're going to have, you know, this, that you're doomed. So my body's ability to lose and maintain a healthy weight is below average. So this is about metabolism. And tied to that is your likelihood of regaining weight. My likelihood of regaining weight is normal. So it's not below average. It's not above average. And so when you couple those two things together, and my genetic risk for being overweight is above average. So again, I know, Courtney, you're gonna say this doesn't, this isn't a doom sentence or, or whatever. But hello, world, I think it kind of explains why I'm not skinny. Okay. And that, you know, um, I have to be mindful. And again, just like the cilantro thing, this is just my propensity based on my genes. So Courtney, can you talk a little bit about those three areas with the metabolism and how we should uh, think about that. You're absolutely right in that you're not doomed um, by these results uh, because what many of the studies that were looking at these specific genes and markers that are used in the section of the report, you know, those studies show that people still did lose weight when they applied certain behavioral strategies. The rate of weight loss may have been a little bit slower the overall amount of weight loss may have been a little bit less than others with a different genetic predisposition, but it didn't. They didn't see in those studies that they did not lose the weight, um, and so I think there, you know, this hopefully gives some people hope um, to see that you're not doomed. Um, that if you really do apply specific behavioral strategies, um, if you adopt practices like self monitoring, so you had mentioned that you're using the My Fitness Health app and really keeping track of your food intake and that, you know, if you're engaging in more physical activity um, and if you're just more aware of those behaviors that can lead to weight loss, that you can be successful. I also think as a dietitian, I would hope that this section of the report kind of helps level set some people. Um, I know we've done some of our own kind of consumer research with our own customers to kind of get a sense of you know, what their weight loss goals are. Um, and for many of us, it, our weight loss goals, we may set ourselves up to have a little bit of unrealistic weight loss goals. Um, you know, we typically want to lose way more um, mm -hmm. than probably what we ideally could lose. I think this can help kind of level set some people to say, okay, you know what, if I'm making those positive behavior changes and going in the right direction, then maybe it is okay if the weight's coming off a little bit slower. If you're going in that right direction and you're getting healthier, I think that, you know, hopefully will motivate people. Absolutely. And uh, looking at those behaviors, and, you know, we see this everywhere as dietitians working with people with weight management. We know that somebody's goal might be 50 pounds, but a 10% weight loss could really change a lot of their um, outcomes, you know, their blood sugars, their blood pressure, that sort of thing. So this isn't, you know, new in any way that, yeah. It, so as you said, it might help us be a little bit more realistic and more empowered about where we're headed. 
So let's talk about exercise real quick. Part of the test is how motivated are you to exercise, uh, which again, I never thought would be genetic. I just kind of thought, you know, it's more, well, you know, certainly your, your lifestyle and your, the way you were raised plays into this as well in your environment. But I am more internally, intrinsically motivated to exercise. And that makes sense because I love, you know, I studied ballet. I love strength training. I'm certainly not, you know, what I would consider an athlete. Uh, I hated running, but I grew to sort sort of like it. I know that I feel better when I do it. And it's as soon as I shifted away from exercising to lose weight and, and then exercising for stress management and now exercising for fun. Yeah, it's 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 been an easy sort of activity for me to 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 keep in my life. But Courtney, you had sort of the opposite results. I did. And I think this is where you and I um, differ greatly in that, you know, my genes tell me that I am not somebody that is intrinsically motivated to exercise. I also, when it, when it comes to my ability to lose fat mass from exercise, you know, I'm predisposed to, you know, cardio and strength training really are not going to work for me. Um, so I could probably do as much cardio as I want. I could build in the strength training. But in terms of moving those numbers on the scale and seeing fat loss and weight loss from from doing exercise, it's going to be challenging for someone with my genotype to actually get there. But I think for me, um, what I know is that there's so many different health benefits that right. you get from exercise. I also know that for me, just mentally, I know I'm the kind of person that once I get to the gym and I'm exercising, I feel great. And mm -hmm. I think those endorphins start to kick in. And, and I love that feeling that I have after I exercise. Mm -hmm. It's just getting there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So someone like you, you have to remind yourself, oh yeah, this doesn't sound like something I want to do, but but you remind yourself through you know past history that once you get there you, you like it and that becomes a game changer. Exactly. Exactly. And I think for me, I you know, seeing my results from this test, it really just kind of confirms that especially when I'm trying to manage my weight, I, I shouldn't be discouraged mm -hmm. if I if I'm going to the gym and, and not seeing progress in terms of weight while I'm at the gym. But and I just have to really keep in mind and be motivated by the fact that I'm getting so many other health aspects out mm -hmm. of it. Um, and just mentally, and as you said, stress management is, you know, exercise and stress management for me is a huge thing. Mm -hmm. um, if I feel that I'm you know, stressed or just overwhelmed with a situation, it's it's usually the first thing I do is put everything down and say, you know, I'm just going to go to the gym for an hour mm -hmm. and I'll be back. <laughs> do the punching bag. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and I can imagine, you know, for many people who might get that result that they're less motivated to exercise that in a way it might just make them feel like, see, this fits for me. Like now I don't have to feel so bad. What's wrong with me? Why do I feel this way? And just say, okay, Genetically, I'm, I'm less interested in it, but I can overcome that barrier to, you know, being active regularly because I know what it is. I can put my finger on it. Right. And, and you know, in our DNA body blueprint, in our report and the content, again, we we really tried to focus on, okay, if, if you have, you know, these predispositions like I have, then it becomes more about, it's, it's really about health and wellness and, mm -hmm. and the importance of exercise. So we're not you know, we didn't want to give people an easy out to say, well, uh, for when it comes to my weight management, I don't have to exercise um, mm. because, because you still have to get out there and exercise. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and then within that category, I rated what is your body's response to strength training? It was enhanced. The options were enhanced, normal or below average. It was enhanced. And I have totally seen that. And we talked about that. And then how does cardio impact your fat loss? I was normal not below average or low. So, you know, those are encouraging. And I know that getting back to what we were saying about exercise and weight loss, I mean, a lot of people, regardless of what their DNA is, get frustrated that I've been exercising regularly and I'm not really losing weight. And maybe they're building muscle, maybe they're losing fat, maybe their diet is counterbalancing, you know, what, what they're doing as far as calories. They're still getting those mental benefits, those the stress management benefits, the physical benefits, the cardiovascular. So you're absolutely right. And I think, you know, it speaks to the larger body of evidence as well around, you know, weight loss and fitness. And what we know is that when we're talking weight loss, you know, diet probably plays a bigger role. 
um, I think where fitness really comes in is when we're talking about weight maintenance. Um, and there's some really good research that says, you know, if you want to maintain that healthy weight, um, you really need to get active. Yeah, that's where the exercise really comes in. Mm-hmm. And and I've interviewed Dr. James O. Hill, who mm-hmm. Courtney, you saw present at the conference we were at, yes. and he's been on my show twice. And he talks a lot about that, uh, you know, and, and it's something that I think we're we're beginning to understand better and uh, share out with with the public that they're both important, but during weight loss, diet's going to be the driver. <laughs> and during weight maintenance, exercise is more of the driver. So great. And then the other section of the report is very interesting. It, it tells you how you process, and Courtney, tell me if I say this wrong, but how you process, how your body likely processes different vitamins, vitamin D, vitamin B12, vitamin C, B6, and so on. And the only one that I'm going to point out is B12. It said my body likely processes vitamin B12 at a lower level of efficiency. And I was diagnosed with a B12 deficiency about 20 years ago. So I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. And so this is another section of that of the report where we, we go through, there's around 11 vitamins and minerals that we look at. And it really focuses on how those genes determine how efficiently your body processes or absorbs these vitamins and minerals. And there's one kind of caveat to this section. And then I always tell people it's not a diagnosis. Again, it's it's the probability. It's not the predictability of whether or not you're going to be deficient in one of these vitamins or minerals. You know, the only true way to know that is is to go to your healthcare provider and get tested. Mm-hmm. But we did feel that this was an important piece to include in our report. Again, this is one of those sections that really doesn't speak to weight management or weight loss, but it does speak to what we heard from our consumers when we were developing this product. Um, and we had, you know, our consumer told us that they really just wanted us to be able to tell them what foods they should be eating based on their DNA. Mm-hmm. You know, while the science really isn't there yet in terms of weight loss to say, you know, Melissa, you should have an apple, whereas Courtney should have grapes. Mm-hmm. Um, where we felt that we could give some guidance is around these vitamins and minerals. And if we knew that people were predisposed to having, you know, lower levels of certain vitamins and minerals, we can make food-based recommendations on you know, here's some foods that you may want to incorporate into your program as well to really go beyond the macronutrient and also start looking at some of the micronutrients in the diet as well. Right. And I think also, you know, could kind of maybe incentivize somebody to just get their levels checked. uh, Because if they do have a deficiency, and like you said, the test isn't saying that, but if they do have a deficiency, certainly that needs to be diagnosed and taken care of. So mine is called the Protein Powerhouse Nutrition Plan. And it gave me the calorie range of 1,200 to 1,400. But Courtney, my understanding is that isn't necessarily tailored to me specifically. Correct. So at this point in time, um, our report for the nutrition plan, we are really looking to the Obesity Obesity Society guidelines. Um, And for women, they recommend between 12 to 1,500 calories. Um, For men, it's around 1,500 to 1,800 calories a day. So right now, those calorie bands that we include in our nutrition plan are not specifically customized to each individual customer. But I do say that this is really where I think dietitians can really come in play Mm -hmm. and help consumers who are taking these reports really customize the calorie range for them. Um, Here at Nutrisystem, we also have our weight loss counselors on staff who can work with our customers to even further personalize their plan and can help kind of look at calorie ranges and what works best for them on that personal level. Yes. And I have a question for you on that. But but first, I wanted to just say uh, for the listeners, they're not just saying, oh, here's your calorie range. You know, they break down the, you know, again, because I'm the protein powerhouse one, you know, like 25% of protein, 45 to 55% carb, 20 to 25% fat. But then it also kind of has like a generic meal plan, like a breakfast, two lean proteins, one good carb, one fruit. It also has uh, choose one of these, choose two of these, choose one of these, and then like a sample a breakfast menu, and it goes all through lunch and dinner and snacks. And so, you know, I think it's a really good starting point. You know, people want that. We always hear people, they think they just want the sample menu, and we kind of have to fill in all the the gaps there. But people do kind of need a starting point. So I think that that's helpful. So I wanted to hear more about your counselors. Um, are they dietitians? Um, do you train them? Like, tell me about how that works. We have um, a really great group of weight loss counselors here at Nutrisystem. 
who are customers on any program that we have can access them for free. Um, they're available by phone. Um, you can email them. You can live chat them. Typically, their background, um, most of them have degrees in psychology, um, nutrition, or health education. We do have a training program, um, a whole training and development department that works with our counselors and, and ensures that they're you know, trained on our programs, trained on kind of the best practices around behavior modification so that if a customer calls in, um, our counselors can really help them establish some SMART goals to work on as part of their program. And then we really encourage customers to stay engaged with our counselors. So, you know, it's not a, a one-off phone call. It's, you know, they'll call a counselor. A counselor will help kind of walk them through, set some SMART goals for them, and then encourage them to call back the next week and kind of check in and see how it's going with their goals. You also have a few CDEs, Certified Diabetes Educators, that work with uh, customers in your diabetes programs? So we do. We have some CDEs on staff um, for our diabetes program. In addition to our weight loss counselors, we also have a whole team of dietary service reps. And these individuals are um, trained to really help our customers that have really specific medical needs. Um, so a lot of times they're working with the customer's physician and really helping to personalize their diet, whether they need you know, a low sodium diet whether they need to av avoid certain foods or whether they're on a medication that requires them to have, you know, less protein than what Nutrisystem's delivering in our high protein program. Our team of dietary service reps can also work to customize meal plans based on one's medical needs. I was fascinated about really the behavior change focus uh, that Nutrisystem has, because I think when people think of Nutrisystem, they think packaged foods, you know, um, but it's really come a long way. So in addition to the behavior change component that's so strong. Do you want to tell us about some of the programs, plans? I know you have an app and also maybe about some of the research that you guys are doing. This year at Nutrisystem, we launched our Fresh Start program um, and we're really working within our program to give more choice to our customers. So we don't want to walk away completely from, you know, we are at the heart of our program, a structured portion controlled meal delivery service where we are providing breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks to our customers along with a meal plan that really shows them how they can incorporate some fresh grocery foods into their day. But, you know, new this year, what we've really been trying to do is integrate more flexibility into the program. Um, so we've introduced what we call flex meals and where, you know, we provide guidance around the types of foods that you should be incorporating into those meals the right portion sizes of those foods that you should be having at those meal occasions. But, you know, this integration of this more kind of holistic approach has allowed us to allow our customer to kind of choose, you know, if they have a, a lunch meeting or if they want to go out to dinner with their family or friends or if they, you know, want to cook a meal with their family, it allows them to have that flexibility and still kind of be on the Nutrisystem program and still be following kind of the principles of the Nutrisystem program. Yeah. I mean, you, you even say, you know, the goal is to help people, you know, they're not going to be on Nutrisystem forever. So the goal is to sort of help people get started, figure out what works for them, transition this into normal everyday foods and into their lifestyle. Correct. And and yes, we, we definitely, you know, we don't want people to live on our food forever. We do realize that we are here as a tool to help you get started. Um, as people move towards their weight loss goal and transition off of the program, we do offer, you know, a variety of transition and maintenance programs for our customers as well. You know, right now we have our success program, which provides color-coded portion-controlled containers, and there's a meal planner that goes with that and really helps helps the customer make that transition from, you know, having so many of their meals be those Nutrisystem meals and now converts that into here's how you can make this on your own and make it really tasty and delicious and still have, you know, lots of variety in the foods you're adding in, but then also still keeping that portion-controlled balanced meal plan that was Nutrisystem. Mm -hmm. Did you want to um, talk about the Numi app? We have a really great app called Numi, and it's one way where we can continue to keep our customers engaged. We know, again, when it comes to weight management and behavior change, engagement is key. Um, and so the more we can keep our customers engaged, the more successful they'll be. Um, so we are always offering different contests and challenges on our app to encourage our customers to track their water intake, to log their foods. Um, so really 
encouraging them and motivating them and incentivizing them to adopt those practices of self-monitoring. But our Numi app does allow customers to really keep track of their food intake. Um, it allows them to track their water and their fitness. And then it also provides the opportunity to connect through the Numi app to our lifestyle blog, Belief, where customers can get really great recipes for some of those flex meals um, and lots of articles around not just nutrition, but also health, wellness, fitness. And anybody can use that app, correct? They don't have to be using any Nutrisystem programs or products? Correct. Yeah. Yep. So so as you when you download the app, you can actually select your meal plan. Um, and so you'll see all the different meal plans that Nutrisystem offers. And then there's also kind of a do-it-yourself kind of I'm not on Nutrisystem meal plan, which is really for that DIY mm -hmm. dieter. Okay. Yeah. I downloaded it. It's free for anybody who might be interested in checking it out. It's N-U-M-I, new me. It's free. And, you know, I like I said, I use my fitness pal, but uh, it's similar as far as, you know, they, it has the barcode scanner, which is key okay. uh, to if you're eating a packaged food and you're just trying to find the right chicken breast or the right, I don't know, cottage cheese or whatever, you know, just scan the thing and it, and it gets all the details in there. So, yeah, anybody can check that out. Anything else about... Uh, oh, the research. What are you guys doing? Can you share uh, what you guys are looking at with regard to research? Uh, well, so, you know, we're always kind of looking through right now. We're actually in the process of thinking through what our clinical strategy will be um, and is going to be over the next few years. Uh, but, you know, we're always looking at testing the safety and effectiveness of our programs. Um, anytime we launch a new program, we will kind of kick off a clinical study with some of our clinical study partners Beyond just kind of what we're doing internally, you know, we also work with a lot of external partners who, you know, see us as, you know, a really great partner, I guess I would say, in their clinical studies. Um, so we've partnered with lots of universities, um, lots of industry partners to provide the food and provide our programs as part of their research studies. Um, so, you know, we always have something going on with clinical research. And, and again, that's one of those reasons that kind of drew me here to Nutrisystem is looking at the clinical research and, and what we're doing in that world. Yes. And when I met you in person, we were chatting over lunch. You shared you were doing something really interesting that I want you to share with our listeners. Uh, it's a certificate of study in clinical research at Drexel. So that just sounds fascinating. Tell me about this program. Yes. Yeah, so I'm, I'm almost finished. I think I have one more semester to get through. But this was something that, you know, a few years ago, my role here at Nutrisystem changed a little bit. And, and I was starting to get a little more involved in our clinical studies. Um, and it was just something that I, I really was intrigued by. And as I said earlier, I always like to challenge myself. And I just happened to come across this program that um, Drexel University offers online, and it's a certificate of study in clinical research. And it just seemed like the perfect fit for me um, to kind of continue my professional development in, in this world of clinical research. And through this program so far, you know, we've really delved deep into how do you effectively design clinical studies? What are the rules and regulations, um, you know, in that FDA world and around designing clinical studies? Looking at, you know, what are the ethical considerations when you're designing um, and implementing studies? And so I think from this program, I've really gained a, a deeper understanding of, you know, what are those best practices in clinical research? And really can help to bring those practices here and ensure that what we're doing at Nutrisystem really is the best of the best and and really is, you know, best practices in clinical research. That is so cool. I'm so jealous. <laughs> <laughs> I have to follow up with you uh, as you finish up and, yeah. and just chat more about it because I just think that's so cool. So before we tell about our really exciting giveaway, I want to remind people about some of the resources. And of course, all of this will be on my show notes at soundbitesrd.com. But you can find out more information about uh, Nutrisystem and the DNA Body Blueprint at Nutrisystem.com. And then the Leaf Lifestyle blog is at leaf.nutrisystem.com. And if you're interested in doing a little bit more of your own research about the DNA Body Blueprint, there is a fact sheet and white paper. And the URL is kind of long, but I will have that link in my show notes because I think that that will uh, give you a lot of great information if you're interested in learning more. And then, of course, um, because Nutrisystem and South Beach are together, there's the southbeachdiet.com and the Palm Lifestyle blog 
is palm.southbeachdiet.com. And of course, the Numi app that we talked about. So drum roll, please. Now we get to talk about our really exciting giveaway. So this episode is not sponsored by Nutrisystem, but they are generous enough to give away not one, but two free DNA body blueprint kits. And this is a $99 value each. So I'll have all the details on how you can enter this giveaway on my show notes at soundbitesrd.com. But basically, you want to share the episode on social media with the hashtag understanding nutrigenomics. I know it's a long one, but understanding nutrigenomics. Tag me at Melissa Joy RD and also leave a review on iTunes. Now, every action that you take counts as a separate entry. So vote early, vote often, and uh, the winners will be randomly selected from those entries um, in U.S. residents only, please. Courtney, thank you so much for offering this really cool test and discussing all my results with me and sharing all this great information out with our listeners. It's been so great meeting you and learning about your really interesting background and all the cool stuff that you get to do at Nutrisystem today and and your uh, clinical research study program as well. You know, I just want to say thank you again as well for having me on your show. And I'm so excited that this was a topic that you were, you know, interested in talking about. And because it's something that, you know, we've been so excited about here at Nutrisystem and really getting this program out to our customers. Yeah, absolutely. Very exciting. And and I, and I think this will be a popular episode. So uh, with that, thank you again, Courtney. And for everybody listening, Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for listening. It really means so much to me. And as always, enjoy your food with health in mind and maybe with a little DNA in mind. Till next time. So as we discussed in the episode, Nutrisystem is giving away two free DNA body blueprint tests. You can enter to win by sharing this podcast episode on Twitter and Instagram, writing a comment in the show notes, or submitting a review of the show on iTunes by March 31st. Each action you take counts as a separate entry. And be sure to tag me at Melissa Joy RD when you post on social media. Winners will be randomly selected, U.S. residents only, please. So again, the deadline to enter is March 31st. And now here are some important announcements from the American Association of Diabetes Educators. There's a new insulin affordability resource that was created by AADE, and it's available at diabeteseducator.org forward slash affordability. This includes the AADE insulin affordability resource, information on the Affordable Insulin Project, an AACE prescription savings directory, a type 1 diabetes health insurance guide, and much more. Also, Diabetes Alert Day is Tuesday, March 26th. And we're encouraging individuals to understand their risk at doihaveprediabetes.org. And that was created by the American Medical Association, the Centers for Disease Control, and the Ad Council. On the healthcare professional side, we're asking educators to look at offering prevention services in their program or clinic by becoming a National Diabetes Prevention Program provider. And more information can be found at diabeteseducator.org forward slash prevention. And finally, a new scoping review and gaps analysis of diabetes online communities was just released in the Journal of Diabetes Science and Technology that supports its benefits as a tool for people with diabetes. All of these links will be in the show notes at soundbitesrd.com forward slash 116. Thanks again for tuning in. Enjoy your day. For more information, visit soundbitesrd.com Music by Dave Burke